Um, let me remind you that we are having the quiz on Tuesday. Okay. Okay, now I remember. It's Friday. Okay. All right, calm down. It was just a refresher for the morning. All right? All right. Okay, uh, so we'll have the quiz on Friday. And um, we know you'll remember that the quiz covers part one. And this morning we are continuing with the first case in part two, um, the case of Britain, comparative politics, or British politics in comparative perspective. And last time we were discussing um, state tradition in history. Um, and the plan for this morning is to continue with it. So we are, we've been, we've done a quick introduction, which was followed by a British state in historical perspective. So, so this morning I'll, I'll continue with, with that and switch to political economy of economic and social policies in Britain in, again, um, in historical perspective. Okay, where did we leave off? I think we just began to talk about, we did talk about new labor and third way, uh, but we didn't talk much about um, conservative dominated coalition under um, David Cameron and Daniel Clegg, which was formed in 2010. Um, May 10 was a surprise. The election on May 10 was a surprise for British citizens because the election did not produce a majority in the parliament. So no party had the majority of seats in the parliament. This is what we call hung parliament. So the parliament cannot move, it just feels hung. Um, that there was no, no majority. This meant that for the first time since World War II, the, there, there emerged a British government which combined elements on both sides of the spectrum, political parties on both sides of the spectrum, political spectrum that is. So we have a conservative government, well a conservative party, coming together with left of center political party. So the conservatives um, formed a coalition with liberal democrats. Liberal democrats, I know we haven't covered the parties and party system yet in British politics. We, we have three, well, two and a half major parties. One is the traditional conservative party. The other is traditional labor party which has always been there um, for more than 100 years for, for both cases. And the third party um, is this, this half party called Liberal Democrats. Um, Liberal Democrats, as we shall be talking about, were part of the Labour Party. Um, they, in a way, seceded from the Labour Party. They got separated from the Labour Party and, and other factions joined them. Um, so this is a more left of Labour Party. So, so Liberal Democrats are on the, you know, on the political spectrum, on the left-hand side, even on the more left-hand side of the uh, Labour Party. So for the first time, there was um, a coalition of right and left-wing parties coming together. Um, the coalition was in a way a blend of the conservative commitment to dynamism of free markets, the classic ideas of laissez-faire, okay? uh, conservative ideals of laissez-faire, let them do, let them make, let them pass, let the free market um, do its job, okay? leave it to the markets and things will be better. Uh, with the, you know, through the workings of the invisible hand, markets will clear, okay? Um, so much less state intervention into the, into the economy, um, as we shall be talking about um, in the next minutes, few minutes, 
uh, we have a government or we have um, a political ideology um, which sees a political party with an ideology that sees state intervention to be relegate, relegated to the realm of um, justice um, and, and basic infrastructure um, and main institutions. Okay. So um, conservative commitment to free markets blended with a liberal democratic commitment, um, Lib Dems, liberal democratic parties commitment to decentralization, which meant that there emerged a new program, a coalition program, in which there was radical ideas, or there were radical ideas of big, what they called big society. And this big society, or under this big society, the coalition um, by Cameron and Clegg emphasized empowering of citizens. This meant, from their eyes, a move or transfer of power away from the state towards communities as well as individuals, families, individuals, so collectivities and, and communities. Um, so um, the state would intervene less increasingly, less in not only the economy, but how the society should be run. Okay? So even you know, police officers um, or um, post offices, all of these, in the governance of these services, citizens would have according to the big society um, program, citizens would have an increased say. Okay? So that, that, was, um, that was, in a way, um, in the eyes of many, a quid pro quo for all the cuts that were to follow, uh, cutbacks on the British welfare state in social services, uh, in the sense that citizens, this was, for, for citizens, the government saw this um, as an appeasement, a tool for appeasement to keep, to keep citizens happy in the wake or after the Great Recession. Okay? So, so mind you, this was a time, I mean, um, the government uh, went, I mean, the government had power right after a massive economic shock. Um, that, that really shook not only Britain, but uh, much of advanced industrialized world. So the Great Recession, which translated into the Eurozone crisis right next door on the continent, um, really shook British politics in that respect. Um, there were bank bailouts. Uh, there was um, increases in massive or massive increases in unemployment, inequality, and all that. So. Um, Cameron came to power as the prime minister. Um, his finance minister, which is in the, in the British context called the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, George Osborne, they formed a team. And Daniel Clegg, representing the Liberal Democrats, joined them. Um, and they, they, they tried to carve some space from the establishment carve out some space from the established establishment of British politics, and they wanted to appeal to a broader clientele. So they wanted to um, emerge more like a catch-all party, like the way Blairite New Labour tried. Okay? So, so, so they, they wanted to have a broader appeal, um, not just business, and labor, but, but all, all other sectors or segments in society, a more non-ideological appeal to British politics and to citizens. And of course, um, recently, uh, 2016, um, 2015 elections, 2016 uh, July, the, um, the referendum decision on Brexit. So, so I think this is uh, where we are in terms of um, state tradition and what we make of the state tradition for contemporary politics. Um, now let me turn to political economy of economic and social policies. And here um, 
I know we've discussed parts of this, um, but let me emphasize here the role of the state in the economy. We know that the British have always opted for the laissez-faire approach. Okay? But there were, there were some, some fluctuations. There, was, there were some ebbs and flows in their understanding or how governments interpreted the British tradition of laissez-faire. Okay? Um, intervention can only be limited to macro policies macroeconomic policies. What do we mean by macroeconomic policies? Macroeconomic policies, what are, what were macroeconomic policies? Any ideas, ladies and gentlemen? Good morning, everyone. Macroeconomic policies. Price floors and price ceilings are microeconomic policies. Wait, uh, let me come back to price ceilings and price floors. These are microeconomic policies in the sense that they are directed to one single market, such as the housing market or markets for oranges. Okay, so so they are micro policies. When we refer to macroeconomic policies, monetary and fiscal policies. Okay. Who is in charge of fiscal policy? OK, let me begin. Uh, who is in charge of monetary policy? Who makes, who designs and implements monetary policy? Central bank. OK. Central bank. In, in an increasingly higher number of cases, we have central banks, which are more or less independent of the executive, i.e., the government. OK, so more, more enhanced political autonomy from the governments. So we have an increasing independence worldwide, a trend uh, towards independence um, of central banks. Uh, Bank of England, um, for, more than, um, for more than a century, has been independent, politically independent of the government. So. Um, but in, in general, we have central banks who design and implement monetary policies. Who designs and implements fiscal policies? Governments. So how does a central bank design? How, how, does, how, do, how do they play? What are their instruments? Let me put it this way. What do they, or how do they stabilize the economy? OK, open market operations, um, discount windows. So, so they basically play with the interest rate. And the interest rate, they play with the interest rate through the workings of the money supply. So they expand monetary base, or they withdraw from the market so they suck up some, some money from the market so that um, the total stock of money decreases in the economy. If total stock of, total supply of anything decreases, what happens to its price? Hmm? Increases. So, so if the central bank sucks up money liquidity from the system, its price is the interest rate. What would happen to the interest rate? If central bank takes away, sweeps into its, its coffers all the money that's available in the economy, in markets, what happens to its price, i.e. the interest rate? Hmm? Increases. Okay, so, so there's, there is scarce money in the system, therefore interest rate increases. If interest rate increases, 
I'm trying to remind you what you've learned a while ago. If interest rate increases, you as consumers, would you like to buy more of other goods or less of other goods? Or can you buy more of other goods with your credit cards and stuff, with, with the possibilities of borrowing? Or would you like to buy less of goods? OK. Think of yourselves, put yourselves in the shoes of an investor. Would you expand your investment or would you reduce your investment? If that makes sense, huh? Because the cost of borrowing is higher. You won't be able to borrow money in case you need money. OK? So, um, so investment also decreases, consumption decreases. Um, if you want to, I mean, for imported items, would you be able to buy more of imports or less of imports? Less of imports. So, so, so all these accumulate. And if the interest rate increases as a result of the operations of the central bank, huh? all demand will decrease. As producers, as firms, because you'll be investing less, will you be employing more workers or less number of workers? OK, so people. Um, there, there may be unemployment or there will be lower levels of employment. Okay? This means that people will have less in their pockets. Workers will have less in their pockets. And this means that they will be able to purchase less of the goods that are available on the market. So, so this is one way how the transmission mechanism works through the workings of the central bank through using it's monetary levers. So um, you, the central bank plays with the, with the monetary base, um, which is called high-powered money. You may remember that too. So um, money, like monetary base, mo money supply, the central bank plays with money supply, you know, increases money supply through expansionary policies or decreases money supply through restrictions or you know, a, a recessionary monetary policy or tight monetary policy. And in that case, the central bank tries to control the economy, stabilize what's called the business cycle. Um, and the government also plays with what levers in or while designing fiscal policies. What are the instruments here, policy instruments? How does the, how does the government design and implement fiscal policies through taxation and spending. OK? So um, if the government expands spending, purchases goods and services in the markets, builds roads, um, builds housing, OK? Um, engages in construction projects purchases all kinds of goods. So firms will make more money. Employment will increase. Output is likely to increase. Okay? Um, or the government decides to implement tighter fiscal policy. That is to say, they want to increase taxes, which includes corporate taxes. Corporate taxes are taxes on firms, corporate units. If taxes on firms, imagine yourselves as a firm. If you know that taxes are increasing, corporate income taxes, whatever you make, whatever you sell, this is your, your gross income of the firm. Some of it you pay to the government as corporate taxes. If you know that the government is increasing taxes, would you be willing to produce more or willing to produce less? OK, that makes sense. 
Okay? So, so this is how the government plays um, with these instruments, G and T. And the idea is to tame the business cycle. Um, this is time. This is level of economic activity. And we know that economic activity is cyclical. And we hope that it has an upward trend of growth. Okay. The idea is that governments, with these tools, tame the business cycle. Instead of such increases in economic activity, so such boom, you in a way wish to bring it down a little. And in case of a recession, you want to you want to flatten this curve. So you want to, um, you want to increase economic activity through these lev levers. Okay? So um, this is the basic you know, um, uh, business cycle model. And this is what was happening in the consensus era, where the state increasingly intervened into markets. Okay? So, um, under the influence of Keynesian ideas, the state, under the influence of Keynesian ideas, the state intervened into the economy through what's called demand management. Um, you'll remember once again that aggregate demand is equal to consumption, investment, government expenditure, net exports. So through this and also the interest rate, the state intervenes into the market to tame the business cycle to fine tune economic activity. So in case of a recession, in case of a recession, the government would implement an expansionary policy mix. So economic activity is going deep down you want to pull it off. Or economic activity is booming. It's becoming inflationary to the extent that there is so much demand in the economy that the risk of increases in prices emerge. And under those circumstances, the government pulls those levers and tries to pull it down, pull economic, the level of economic activity down. OK, this is called from the Keynesian perspective, Keynesian demand management. You, you manage demand, and by doing so, you tame the business cycle. Okay? And by taming the business cycle, you, in a way, fluctuate, I'm sorry, you stabilize the economy. Okay? Through, once again, the workings of the government. This was the high time consensus era, this was the high time when states increasingly, not only in Britain, but elsewhere too, states increasingly learned to intervene into markets to stabilize their economies. And this consensus era, once again, starts when? Come on, guys. Starts when? No, when did the, this era start? Did I not talk about it? World War II, hmm? after World War II, so, so in the post-World War II era, we see a massive um, intervention by the state, that there was a consensus among um, policy actors. Um, you know, business says, OK, I'm going to let the government play a role. I won't be competing with the government. Labor says, OK, I won't ask for a socialist revolution. I'll be fine with the social democratic approach. So they shake hands, and there emerges the consensus. It's called collectivist consensus, 
because that there is because of the fact that there is a large role for government collectivist ways of making decisions as opposed to individualist ways of making decisions if you would leave how the economy works to the workings of the markets then this would be the opposite of collectivist or collectivism or collectivist ideologies. Um, anyway, so um, the idea would be under this era uh, where the policies were that the state um, wished to reach full employment. And by full employment, what do we mean? Or what do I mean by full employment? Is it that everybody is working all time, like night and day. So what is full employment? Any, any ideas about what full employment is? Please. Uh, natural level of unemployment, natural rate of unemployment. Very good. So it's the rate at which all factors of production, including labor here, are put to efficient use. Okay, so all factors of production will be put to efficient use and that the economy would be achieving full employment and at that level there would be some unemployment which is referred to as the natural rate of unemployment. So natural rate of unemployment is, um, we shall be talking about this in a minute, uh, natural rate of unemployment is the the rate of unemployment at which there is full employment, okay, uh, of all factors of production, especially um, we mean labor. Um, so, so Keynesian demand management, in order to tame the business cycle, means that um, policymakers, the omniscient technocrats, would be implementing what's called a counter-cyclical policy. The cycle is going down. The role of the bureaucrat, the policymaker, the technocrat, is to pull it up. If the cycle is going up, you pull it down. That's why it's called counter-cyclical, sometimes referred to as anti-cyclical. Okay? So you go, as a policymaker, you go against the cycle. If the economy is booming, you want to soothe it, calm it down. If it is overheating, you want to keep it, keep it at a normal level. Um, if the economy is diving, nose diving, you intervene huh, through expansionary policy mixes to pull it off, or pull it up, uh, pull it up. I'm sorry. And uh, one way of um, intervention was the welfare state, what's called the Keynesian welfare state. Um, the welfare state, how does the welfare state um, help tame the business cycle? What's the welfare state? What are different programs in the welfare state? When we talk about the welfare state, what do we refer to? Hmm? What are the welfare state programs? What are welfare state programs? Come on. I know you know the answer. Welfare state programs. What's the welfare state? What are the different programs? Redistribution of wealth, equality, these are the goals. What about the programs? How does the welfare state do these, I mean, attain these goals or aim at these goals? What kinds of programs? What are the welfare state programs? Job opportunities through, let's say, public employment. Um, but that's also, that's only part of what welfare states do. But welfare states are comprised of many, many, many programs. One is the largest program, pensions. 
old age pensions. Pensions, does it ring a bell? Pensions? Retirement pensions, retirement income? Okay, so pensions. Social assistance, very good, okay. Progressive taxation. <laughs> Progressive taxation um, and also um, public employment. These are beyond the standard programs. But let's go back to the programs themselves, ladies and gentlemen. Um, pensions. We know what pensions are, retirement pensions. Then comes the second largest program, almost, else, uh, almost everywhere. Healthcare. Education. If I say unemployment insurance, does it ring a bell? Unemployment insurance, okay? If I say child care, welfare state. So these are publicly provided or partly publicly provided programs. And these include um, pensions, healthcare, unemployment insurance, child care, social assistance. What else? I'll, I'll come back to your question. Um, what else? Another program. Regional policies. Uh, land reform, yes. What else? These are all redistributive policies. Security for? I'm talking about the welfare state. Inequality, jobs, redistribution. Um, security is a basic function of the state, true. But what about other functions or other programs, um, such as disability, such as housing, all of which are protecting the citizens against risks in the labor market. So in that respect, these are called this, these are called social insurance programs. And these are called social assistance programs. So, um, so citizens in the labor market, labor force participants, in case of risks of unemployment, what does the welfare state do? Healthcare or, let's say, sick pay. In case of you working, okay, you found a job, you make millions, and that was nice, wasn't it? Uh, and there, you get laid off. You get fired. What happens if you live in a welfare state? Huh? You claim for unemployment insurance, unemployment benefits. So in, in, the, in the incidence of the risk of unemployment materializing, the state protects you. You are working in the labor market. You get married. You're a woman. Then something happens. Something nice happens. Then after some time, you won't be able to work. Hmm? Right? For at least, for example, in the Turkish welfare state, for four months. You won't be able to work. The state pays for your hmm, benefits, maternity benefits. 
you receive maternity benefits, benefits from the state in the case of risk of pregnancy. The risk materializes, you become pregnant. The risk of you being out of the labor force, that is. Okay? Um, and the risk of old age, hopefully it will materialize for us all. We'll all retire, hopefully. Hmm? We reach that age after having worked for many years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. We reach that age and we retire, right? Then the risk of old age materializes, then the state will protect us through giving us pensions. Okay? So, um, bless you. So, so all of these risks, if and when they materialize, the state protects us hmm, from risks in the labor market. Okay? For not being able to, to work, that is. Um, so, um, with all these policies, the state wants to or aims at stabilizing the business cycle. And these are ways of also playing with demand in the sense that if there is massive unemployment in the economy, let's say unemployment reaches 15%. The state intervenes, steps into the economy in a way, and provides public employment or short-time work. But it also intervenes into the economy by providing unemployment benefits to those who are laid off from, from their work, from their jobs. Okay? So in a way, these are all instruments of the state trying to stabilize the economy. These are all post-World War II inventions. Some forms of welfare had always existed. You know, there, there is, um, we read about um, Karl Polanyi's account of uh, the Spinemland law, you know, 18th century Britain. So, so some form of poor laws or social assistance had always existed, but comprehensive, systematic welfare states emerged in the post-World War II era under Keynesian influences. Okay? Um, so what I'm trying to get here is that um, we'll talk about the British welfare state in a little bit more detail later on, but my point here is that the state intervenes into the economy not only through macroeconomic policies, but also through social policies. Okay? So the state has a set of levers, policy instruments, and plays with those. Okay? And, um, and all of these policies went on for about 25 to 30 years, from the end of um, World War II, mid-1940s, till about when um, a great recession shook advanced industrialized world and elsewhere um, in the early 1970s. So 1972, 73, uh, later on 19, sorry, 1978, 79, OPEC oil or OPEC's oil-induced shocks, which brought with them recessions. Um, and um, the, first re the first shock was in the early 1970s. The second shock was in the late 1970s. And the late 1970s, um, winter of discontent, um, political turmoil, no government that came to power could stabilize the economy. Unemployment had been increasing. Demand had not been or was not able. I mean, policymakers could not stabilize demand. And then the pendulum switched or swung from collectivism to individualism. 
Okay? Uh, let's not do it the collectivist way. Let's do it otherwise. And there emerged Margaret Thatcher's um, reign. And um, Thatcher implemented um, neoliberalism. And within neoliberalism, we can talk about four sets of policies. The first policy is liberalization. What do we mean by liberalization? Liberal policies, liberalization. Let me give an example. In foreign trade, if you want to liberalize your current account, your imports and exports, that is. How do you liberalize your foreign trade? How does one, how do policymakers liberalize foreign trade? Hmm? Decreasing taxes, customs, taxes, tariffs, when you're importing goods. So, so you liberalize your imports, OK? Um, or or you, you roll back the state in intervening into exports. You liberalize those policies, foreign trade policies, um, external policies. Um, privatization. In the collectivist era, and right before then, during World War II, there were collectivizations, nationalizations. And these nationalizations produced a massive size in terms of how, how much the state was intervening into the economy, as was the case in Britain. Hmm? Remember, I, I shared with you um, some figures that the British state just grew massively after World War I. And by the end of World War II, 1960s, 1970s, by about 1980, the British state reached, um, in terms of G as a share of GDP, reached um, or exceeded 40%. Meaning that 40% of all goods and services produced in the British economy in a given year were purchased by the state. So the role of the state got expanded um, in a secular way. Um, it jumped during World War I. Then came Great uh, Depression, then World War II, then afterwards, with all these policies, consensus policies or consensus era policies, with increased the state intervention into the economy, we, uh, we witness massive expansion of the state in the economy, massive expansion of the role of the state in the economy. Um, so, so once we have a large state, Thatcher says, it is those policies that are responsible for British decline. So we undo those policies by privatizing these assets, state-controlled assets, state-owned enterprises, state economic enterprises. Just, just privatize them. Um, British Airways, British Telecoms. Okay. Um, so, so, so these were um, incrementally. Um, privatized. So th that's, that's another, I mean, that's a second set of policies. A third set of policies is deregulation. Deregulation of labor, labor laws. By regulation, I mean those legislations or pieces of legislations that regulated how labor markets work. And such as examples are um, minimum wage laws, health and safety at work, occupational, um, special occupational um, legislations aiming at um, certain restrictions. So all of these restrictions, regulations, would be undone under neoliberal ideology. And finally, we have monetarism, um, which sees inflation as the chief economic evil. Here in the consensus era, the chief economic evil was unemployment. 
But here in this era, under the influence of first Hayek, then Milton Friedman and others, um, the idea of monetarism, the policy precepts of monetarism dictated that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So you need to um, set monetary supp money supply targets and you need to work at a level of natural rate of unemployment. So you need to control this evil, control inflation, and do not play with G and T. Emphasize monetary policy. Because inflation, the chief economic evil, is a monetary, simply a monetary phenomenon. So you need to solve the problem, monetary problem, with monetary levers. Okay? So you implement recessionary policies, tight monetary policies, and um, minimally use fiscal policies. Um, so, so this is how the pendulum switched between collectivism and free markets. Uh, once again, this is the era between mid-1940s and you know, mid-1970s for about 25 to 30 years. And this is the this is, these are the sets of policies that came after um, with the conservative revolution under Thatcher uh, that emerged in the 1980s. Any questions up until here? Have a nice weekend.